Good evening, everyone. It's very nice to see you here all, especially as we're actually having some summer outside. So let's hope maybe because it's Indian Summer Festival, that's why summer has finally arrived. I am Belle Puri, and it's my pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, it is quite an evening of firsts, but I know we're going to have a great time because the evening hadn't even started, and I was having a wonderful time chatting with old friends who I hadn't seen in a while and uh, making lots of new friends already tonight. I am with CBC News Vancouver, um, Monday to Friday. You can watch us at 5 o'clock and on weekends at 6 o'clock. And I want to tell you that CBC is really thrilled to be a sponsor of this event. As you just heard, the anticipation leading up to last night's opening and tonight and the events has been, um, you know, it's just been building. You've probably read about it in the newspapers, heard about it on the radio, um, watched highlights on television. So finally, we're here. And it is is, um, tonight is the first official event of this first Indian Summer Festival. So tonight we're going to launch the film and literature series. It's also a first for our two special guests tonight, which of course are Thabu and Jan Martel. They have not uh, met until tonight, so that's all very interesting. Let me just tell you a little bit about each of them, because um, you're going to get to know them quite well by the time we're finished this evening. Thabu made her screen debut in 1985, and since that time, she has starred in over 70 films. <laughs> that said, 1985 wasn't that long ago, so 70, 70 films, and several of them, of course, have been huge successes and box office hits. If you know anything about Bollywood, then you do know about Thabu. She is one of India's most lauded actors. She four times has won the Film Critics Award for Best Female Performer. Now, in those 70 films that I was talking about, they are in six different languages. So if that wasn't enough, recently she swept Hollywood and North America. Thabu starred in Mira Nair's The Namesake, which we're going to see later this evening. It's a wonderful story that was uh, originally written by Champa Lahiri, so I look forward to seeing that tonight as well. I've read the book, but uh, not seen the movie. Um, most recently, and why we're here tonight, Thabu has completed filming Ang Lee's adaptation of Life of Pi, based on Jan Martel's novel. Which, of course, brings me to Jan. He is an author, he has a collection of short stories, and he has three novels to his name. Um, when you hear his name, of course, most likely, you do think of Life of Pi. Um, if you'll let me, I have to tell you, when I read it, I read the original um, colorful paperback version, and then a little while ago got the hard copy with the illustrations, and, and just love having it. Um, but that original, uh, the paperback, you know, you all have rules in your house about don't read at the table, don't read during meals, don't do this. Well, I carried it around and, you know, would read between uh, going to work, read between doing dishes, and then finally the day that I was had, you know, just a few more pages left, sat at the breakfast table one Saturday morning and just read and had a bite and read. And it was just, if you haven't read it, um, you, you just need to pick up this book. It's, it's wonderful. It won Yen the 2002 Man Booker Prize. It was a global bestseller. I think uh, a mere eight million people bought copies of this book. And uh, since then, he has another novel. It's Beatrice and Virgil. And he's also made news headlines as well. Uh, you may recall his book club. Two members, Jan and Stephen Harper. That was it. <laughs> he sent uh, the prime minister a book every two weeks for four years, and each book had a letter with it explaining why this book was worth reading. There were novels, there were plays, poetry, graphic novels, even children's books. And uh, now, 55 of those letters have been put together and uh, are in a book. And the book is called, What's Stephen Harper Reading? <laughs> Well, um, this is really a conversation between Jan and Tabu, so I'm, I just got the best seat in the house, really. I'm just going to sit here and, <laughs> and enjoy this. Um, but I thought I would kick things off by just asking a couple of questions, because I think it's so interesting. One of the most interesting things when you meet someone who's so accomplished, and I, I know you wouldn't talk about this yourself, because you're both modest people, despite being so accomplished, is it's interesting to know how you got to this point. And, uh, 
you know, and, and I would really like to, you really like you to talk to each other about what you're curious about, but uh, Tabu, uh, if I may ask you, I mean, you've, you've made some very unusual choices in your films. I mean, I think there's that, um, especially in, in, in Canada here, there's, there's often a stereotype that Bollywood films are all about song and dance and a certain stereotypical pattern, but you're, you're an actress who's definitely not done work like that, and you've, you've worked in such a wide variety of, of films. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your choice of films and the, and the work you've done? Um, what, how, how do you sort of um, explain your unusual choices? I'm trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> um, well, I started with the regular kind of films. I still do the regular kind of films also. It's just that when these films came to me, they uh, felt so interesting and mm. challenging. And uh, I think for any actor or for any creative person mm. uh, to be challenged with something like that is fantastic. Mm. And it just uh, uh, gave me a platform to express parts of myself, maybe, and to express who I am and what I think and what I believe in. And I felt that these characters would come easily to me. Mm. I could find myself in them. And I thought I'd have uh, fun creating mm. these characters. Mm. So it just so happened that mm. these roles were really fantastic. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's true when you watch your films that from one film to the next, I sometimes can't even recognize you because you're mm -hmm. so, you know, you've taken on the character so completely that, that you're immersed you. in it totally. Thank so, you. and. And I, I think that's wonderful. And uh, but but you know that immersing yourself in in different roles is also something a writer does. No, Jan. I mean, even your books sort of, you know, they jump from one genre to to another and um, have yeah. been so different. Yeah, I think the path of a writer is very different from the path of an actress in that um, there's a huge um, overhead in movies, of course. Mm. And there's directors. There's such a, it's such a huge business to, to create a movie. To write a story essentially is very simple. Mm. You don't even need a, a computer or a typewriter. Actually, you can just actually write it on a piece of paper with a pen. So there's very little overhead. So um, I guess what's directed me in writing each of my books is an evolving interest in things. So each of my books has been a way to understand something that interested me. So my very first book, which was a collection of short stories. I was interested in looking at what stories could do. What can a story mean to someone? What, what are stories for? So I was exploring the very art of fiction in my first book. Um, so each book has explored a different pattern. So Life of Pi, my background is completely secular. I'm from Quebec, it's a very secular province. Um, so I grew up with no gods in my, in my house at all. And in fact, quite an anti-clerical household. Mm -hmm. Very typical, my parents are very typical of their generation not liking religion at all, seeing only the negative side of it. Mm. And so they replaced religion with art, literature, right. visual arts, music, cinema. And I grew up happily in that. And then at one point I became interested in the phenomenon of religion. I sort of benignly was sort of curious about what does it mean to have faith? Because it's very unreasonable, of course, to have faith. Uh, and we tend to be, especially in Canada, especially in, in Quebec, very secular society, to, to be very reasonable. Reason mm. is very empowering. So I was curious about religion. So I decided to, to, to write a novel featuring a character who has faith. Mm. Just as in, I was intrigued by that. So it was writing Life of Pi was my way to look at the phenomenon of religion. And my subsequent novel, Beatrice and Virgil, was looking at the Holocaust. Mm. I was interested in looking what can the imagination do with the Holocaust. Mm. So it, it, to me, you know, it was my way of understanding something in, in, for myself. And I was lucky in that uh, I, I managed to get them published and people... And it still amazes me that people want to read my stuff, you know. <laughs> they, I, I remain eternally grateful, because if you think of a life of Pi, you know, Quebec, as I said, is a strongly secular society, and here I am writing a novel which posits that faith is not just pure nonsense, but is actually a serious thing. Mm. And I sort of ignore all the horrible things about religion, the patriarchy, the sexism, the homophobia. I wasn't there to explore that. Right. I was explored as, you know, why are some people, you know, why was Gandhi full of faith? Mm. Why was Martin Luther King? Uh, and it's also a novel in which I defend zoos. And most people think zoos are horrible cages for animals and every animal would love to escape. So here I was taking on two, what I thought was very un un unpopular subjects and, and putting them in one book. 
Mm. But I just felt I wanted to deal with that. Yeah. I mean, in a, in a strange way, the it, your life of Pi actually has all the elements of mythology. It's religion, animals, um, you know, and uh, just a few more ingredients, and you've got it. And and I, I mean, I, I think I recall you saying at one point that, and this reminds me of a character in P.G. Wardhouse called Smith. I don't know if you know the character Smith. He always says, "Never confuse the impossible with the improbable." Um, and there's and there's something of that in the life of Pi. I mean, do you want to say something about? Well, that's because of India, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, this mixture of mythology and, 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 and religion, and, and mm. that, that to me is India. Mm. And thank God, I, I wrote Life of Pi in large part because I was in India. It was my second time there. The first time I was there, I was backpacking for six months. I was dazzled by the country. And I decided a few years later to go back. And that's when I started writing Life of Pi. And thank God I was in India. If I'd been in Switzerland, you know, or in Sweden, you know, uh, which is not quite a place so full of myths and magic, and you know, uh, it'd be a novel featuring bankers, perhaps, or something. So thank God I was in India, and because uh, uh, India is like that. India's well, the title could have stayed the same because pi is still two point one four or something, whatever. It is. Yeah, three point one four. Yeah, yeah, pi, was, but everything around there. Yeah. Um, so it really was India actually that brought this. Not that the novel is about India, you mm. know. Uh, uh, it starts in India, and, and you know the character is Indian, of course, mm. and he practices religions that one finds in India. Mm. Uh, uh, but it, for me, it was definitely that that there's an an imaginative charge to India, which is why Indian literature has been you know read around the world for the last several decades. Right. I think because it is a place where storytelling uh, uh, comes so easily. I think there are so many stories in India. Right. Yep. Would you agree with that? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I look around and think there's a story on every corner, and it's almost hard to filter the stories out. Yeah, but that's how we've grown up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when you grow up, you uh, want to like, tell your parents what nonsense you were telling. There's <laughs> 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 nothing of it is ever true. Mm. But yeah, storytelling is, I think, uh, uh, the most one of the most important parts of growing up. Yeah. And so many things about life, I relate to stories. And mm. so many things now make sense, you know, and you go back to uh, remembering what your grandmother had said mm. and what your grandfather had mm -hmm. said. And, and you find all, these are all characters that you meet every day in your life yeah. also. You yeah. Know? But uh, yeah, there has to be a way of making children or even adults believe or imagine something. Yeah. So I think it's a great, uh, it's a great thing. It's a great... Uh, some people have a beautiful knack of telling stories mm. and not everyone can tell a story nicely or mm. well, like everyone can't make a film yeah. properly. Yeah. So it's great, I think. Yeah, I think you might have shared a you know, similar childhood to mine where you were force fed food and stories at the same time. I mean, Absolutely, <laughs> like from my mother to my governess to everyone. <laughs> yeah. You know, and she yeah. made these all imaginary uh, creatures out of the morsels yeah. And one was the sun, and one was the moon, and one was the bear, and everything. <laughs> so you've eaten quite a lot of things in your lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the moon, uh, there was this old lady sitting in the moon, hmm. and she was, you know, spinning a wheel. That's hmm. what we were told. Hmm. And whenever I looked at the moon, I would try to find where the old lady was sitting. <laughs> 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 and when I grew up, I wanted to just call my grandmother wherever she was. She passed away and tell her, why did you tell me all this nonsense about there's an old lady sitting in the moon? <laughs> I spent quite a bit of time you know, looking yeah, for trying her. trying to find her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, coming back to that, in a sense, that's the interesting movement you have from childhood to adulthood and, and what Pi goes through in your novel. Mm -hmm. It's this thing of what is real and what is not real and does it really matter and is, but isn't it just about the story sometimes? And, and I don't know, I mean, uh, how do you find that taboo with film? I mean, I, forgive me because I'm just curious uh, mm -hmm. how, how, how an actor does this, but how does it feel to just sit on the other side of that screen and see yourself being another character, this mirror of you over there that you've brought to life and yet is not you? I mean, it's that same kind of blur between reality and, and fiction. <laughs> yeah, it's this uh, really intriguing and strange phenomena which I have been myself trying to understand. Mm. Um, this whole uh, thing of creating an image, you know. I feel uh, movies, uh, the cinema industry, the film industry is uh, like a small... Uh, 
prototype of the entire world, mm. the entire universe sometimes mm. I feel. Mm. Because like in philosophy, according to philosophy, everything is, um, it's Maya, mm. it's just a dream, mm. it's, you know, it's, it's not real, yeah. like they say. Mm. So it's like that in the movies, what you see is just images and the reality is something else. Mm. So uh, it's, it's really uh, hard to just, you know, decode this. But uh, uh, as far as it comes to me making these characters, it, it's, it feels very funny when I see myself, mm. uh, you know. <laughs> it still feels funny too. Especially when I see it after <coughs> a long time, like when I saw this AV yesterday in oh, Seattle, yeah. I was like, oh, I've done so much work, that is me <laughs> also. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, though there is a divide between who you are mm. in real life and the character you're playing, mm. there is some part of you which is also becoming the character mm. and some part of the character which is definitely you because uh, you are there in flesh and blood mm. playing those characters in front of the camera. Right. So it can't be so, you, there can't be such a demarcation. You, right. know, you can't like switch on and switch off. Mm. So somewhere it becomes one. Yeah. And that's the magic of cinema, I feel. That's the magic of acting. And that's right. why acting and as a profession or as an art form is so engaging and satisfying. Mm. Because it allows you to express yourself and be somebody. Mm. You know, I think as actors, we are really blessed. Mm. Mm. And, and you bring a lot of delight to a lot of people as well in that I process. Hope I do. <laughs> Very much so. But uh, Jan, I mean, you've done a bit of acting yourself, I hear, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> lately. <laughs> nah. Sirish is referring to the fact that um, I was an extra <laughs> <laughs> in Life of Pi. <laughs> I just sit on a bench. And it was wonderful that Ang Lee invited me to Montreal. So in, in the movie, um, in, the, in the book, if some of you remember, the Patels mean to immigrate uh, to Canada and Pi eventually ends up in Toronto. Well, none of the directors who were going to work on Life of Pi ever wanted to film in Toronto. They had no interest <laughs> in going to Toronto. So very early on, the Patels were, uh, Pi would end up in Montreal. So <laughs> the last two days of the shoot were in Montreal because most of the movie was done in, in India, in, in Pondicherry and in Taiwan. And the last two days of the shoot were in Montreal. And very kindly, they invited me to be an extra. So there's a, you'll see, if you see the movie, there's a scene where there'll be me, played by Tobey Maguire, <laughs> next to Irfan Khan, who plays older Pi. They're sitting on a bench, and there's a little pawn, and there's some guy on a bench on the other side <laughs> who's just sitting there writing notes. And that's me. <laughs> and I was very flattered that three times Ang Lee walked all the way around the pond to sort of critique my performance. <laughs> and he said at one point, you're lifting your head too high. <laughs> so, uh, okay. And he afterwards he said, he was very sweet, he said, you're very good at playing yourself. <laughs> and he said, most people aren't good at that. As soon as they're uh, asked to play themselves, they sort of... Anyway, but yeah, I, I just sat there and, uh, and I was amazed too. I, I was saying how simple it is to write a story in a sense. You just sit at your computer mm. and there's nothing else. Well, mm. for these two days of shooting, one day involved shooting plates of Indian food that will appear in the scene uh, where Pai has hallucinations about food. You didn't start in that bit, though. No, I, well, I would like to eat the food, but... And that scene, just filming plates of food, the crew, everyone involved in filming was like 30 people. 30 people to film, you know, a, a, a doll. Uh, and the next day with this benching, same thing, about 30, 40 people. So I said, the, the enterprise of making a movie, yeah. when you think that I wrote Life of Pi all on my own in a little empty room in Montreal, mm. I had roommates, as I, I've said, I, two years before finishing Life of Pi, my total income was $6,000 for that year. <laughs> I was way under the poverty line, but I lived like a prince because I just had to deal <laughs> with these characters. Every morning I woke up and my only concern mm. was these characters, this boy in this lifeboat mm. with these tigers. And so I loved the life. It was a wonderful, rich life of the imagination but involving no one else. It was a totally, it was a beautifully yeah. solitary life working on this story. And to see 10 years later, this vast production, <laughs> you know. Uh, so now uh, you know what we go through. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, it's so much harder work than writing the book. I mean, the book was a lot of work, but it was, it was a pleasure. There's it's no sitting own. for hours it's, in a lifeboat. It's yours, it's your own. Writing is just 
your own thing. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's just so much easier than than uh, <laughs> yeah. the stories I was hearing about the making of this movie. Uh, you know, just the sitting on the lifeboat. The, the 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 it was in Taiwan because Ang Lee is of course originally Taiwanese, and the Taiwanese are in love with him. He's their cinematic superstar. So. The Taiwanese government was very generous in helping him. So they built this enormous tank in which they did all the, the filming of the maritime scenes. So they did location shooting in, in, in India, in, in Pondicherry. And most of the, the core of the story was filmed in Taiwan in this enormous tank. And um, you know, they have blue screens in cinema, this, this black ground that is blue and they can impose anything on that. Well, they built this enormous blue screen using containers, from shipping containers, and they were seven stories high. I mean, it was this huge production. And to think that this all started with me just writing, you know, <laughs> the ship sank, period. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's very easy to do, the ship sank. <laughs> and then years later, millions of dollars later, and headaches, and you know, it's just astonishing. So, Contracts and signing yeah, yeah, yeah. and traveling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it astounds me. So, and for that, I'm very grateful. By the way, you know, we were saying the, we're talking about the importance of stories, which are not just entertainments. Of course, stories are a wonderful way to to understand the world. You know, religious stories is an example. Christians understand life through the story of Christ. Hindus through the stories of Hinduism. Uh, Muslims through the story of Allah and you know and Muhammad and all that. Uh, but otherwise, too, you know, secular stories are a way to give us an experience of life that we don't directly have. So they teach us about life. They're sort of like vaccination. You get vaccinated, and now you can deal with diseases that might come your way. In a sense, stories can be like that. Yep. You know, you read, uh, you read stories, and you somehow are prepared to confront life. So, they're, so I was incredibly grateful. I'm still grateful that this story that I concocted out of mm. my imagination has done so well, has been taken by so many people, which is certainly not a given. You know, any number of stories are born and, and mm -hmm. die right away, read only by the mother of the author. <laughs> you know, um, and so. that too in 3D is going to be. Uh, yes, and. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it's yeah. Oh, okay. being shot in 3D. Yeah, so those plates of Indian food, that, to that, <laughs> that doll and all that, that was in 3D. But 3D is better than it used to be. I remember 3D when you take off the glasses and it'd be like garish, it'd be like red and mm. red and green or whatever. Mm. I was, because I was seeing the, the, the takes and it's extraordinary. Now there's, it barely looks ever so slightly out of focus and mm. it's still in color. Then you put the glasses on and it's definitely 3D. Mm. Um, so I said, you'll see me in, two, in 3D behind Tobey <laughs> Maguire there, <laughs> but it'll be more impressive when you see the scenes in the, the ocean. The producer was telling me that you know, in a scene like this, for example, the 3D would be kind of pointless because that background is not interesting. You would see that there's a distance between us, between us and the background. But if you think of it, water becomes, it goes into the background in a progressive way and each bit of the water is moving. So the line producer was telling me, you, when you see the 3D with the water, it's absolutely spectacular. Hmm. It, it's, it's truly an extraordinary effect. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Mm -hmm. So, Tabu, your world is so different in that sense. I mean, yeah, here's yeah, Jan completely. sitting alone, you know, <laughs> clattering away, but you're probably... I wish I could work in isolation <laughs> like that, yeah. not having to deal with anybody, mm. no contracts, mm. <laughs> no makeup, no hair, mm. just do it on my own. Yeah. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I was just curious, you know, is that something in a sense that you... Because you're surrounded by people all the time, there's, mm. I, I can tell you, sort of being an author not as accomplished as Jan myself, is that authors are like kind of waiting for someone to recognize them, you know, and like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and sort of hoping that somebody will come up with a book and sign it. We just, you know, we throw ourselves at any occasion that we can possibly, and sort of put some people in the audience and say, oh, you. But, um, <laughs> You, you kind of, <laughs> you're, oh, well, yeah, sometimes, small feet. But, but you have the opposite problem. I mean, you, wherever you go, I mean, you must find people saying, oh, you, were you in, and, and, and I mean, how do you, I guess, how do you uh, sort of work with this group of, again, I'm asking from the ignorance of someone who knows nothing about film, but you have 30, 40, 40 people for a dal, so how many people are around you? I mean, <laughs> 330,000. Yeah. <laughs> so, how I deal how with you, it? Yeah, how do you deal with that? How do you, where do you find privacy? How do you. On set? Yeah. Or generally? On set, generally, anything? I, I don't find privacy. Oh, gosh. <laughs> at all. And now, with the media 
hmm. and with people having their cameras and their mobile phones hmm. you cannot have privacy anywhere even in the aircraft people are <laughs> shooting you and <laughs> everywhere <laughs> anyway you go you're watching a movie coming out of a theater and they're there yeah so it's a menace nowadays i must say <laughs> hmm. though technology has made life easier yeah but uh, at times it's really really uh, annoying yeah. i think it's really an intrusion of privacy hmm. but uh, you learn to detach from all that you should i mean if you want to be in this profession mm-hmm. uh, it is tough because uh, it uh, <coughs> you lose your sense of isolation when you're working which is so important mm. especially for an actor to mm. be to be focused and there's yeah. so many people just there yeah. looking at you but i guess uh, when you start because i started very young so i got into the practice of uh, doing my job mm. uh, despite having so many people around yeah you know sometimes it's it's not very comfortable yeah but then you just learn to do it i think you take it as a part of your profession and something yeah. you yeah. have to deal with Yeah. <laughs> yep. I wish I didn't have to, but yeah. It's okay. That's that's that, there's an upside to it also. Yeah. You know, uh you cannot deny the pleasure of being uh, uh acknowledged and recognized for your work yeah. and appreciated. Yeah. You know. Um it, it's great when people uh, come up to you and have uh, uh great things to say. Not just great things like in praise, but uh when you understand that you have touched them and their lives in some way and they have been affected in some way with your work or with your personality it's it's great to know that right. that you made a difference so yeah, see she's coming the, yeah the lone insect <laughs> in this room descends on me. you i mean you know <laughs> why why not me why not yeah <laughs> come here come here come here <laughs> some perks of being a woman also no? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, with us two uglies here. No. <laughs> I'm not going to drive poor anymore. <laughs> I have to say it's one of the pleasures of being a writer is that it's not that we hide behind our words, but it's our books are what's out there. Mm. And so it's rare that an author, I mean some authors I suppose like, you know, John Irving is particularly well known. you know i think people know what he looks like but it's rare that i mean in in where i live in saskatoon people might recognize me in montreal sometimes i'll be recognized but it's fairly rare so it never becomes a nuisance mm. and it's so it's the book that's that's you know it's life yeah. of pie that was a success it wasn't yeah. me uh, but i agree with with what tabu said that the the real pleasure in the success of life of pie you know wasn't the fame wasn't the money is the, how the story connected mm. one thing i got and i still receive is a is a deluge of letters especially from Americans. Americans are very chatty people. So <laughs> I get so many letters from Americans, complete strangers who tell me how their book touched them. And it's sometimes, you know, and it's it, it's I think it's peculiar to, to Life of Pi, which is a, after all a, a novel about choice, about yeah. there's one set of facts and there's two ways you can interpret those facts. And I, you know, and some of incredibly touching stories. I remember one from a woman, it's a terrible story. She went to Belize <laughs> on a holiday and she was kidnapped by her taxi driver. and held by him for 3 days and assaulted by him for 3 days and she said to herself while this was happening she said he's the tiger and i must survive him my god so she interpreted herself as being in the lifeboat and the taxi driver was and i've heard letters from people who said you know i have cancer and while i had cancer that the cancer was the tiger right. all these people are interpreting them the story in a way that was deeply meaningful to them. Mm. And then they write to me often by the most circuitous route, of course, they don't know where I live, so they'd write to my publisher in New York, who'd send it to my publisher in Toronto, who'd send mm. it to my agent in Toronto, who'd send it to me in Saskatoon. You know, these be really travel-worn letters. Mm. Uh and they they felt compelled to write to me. And that <coughs> really is the most touching is to feel that you've 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 entered these people's lives and became mm. a part of it. Right. Mm. And that's the most touching thing. That's what yeah. I've loved about it. Mm. Mm. I mean speaking of letters is this a rumor or did President Obama send you a letter about Yeah yeah, yeah. out of yeah. the blue uh, President Obama wrote me a letter yeah. uh handwritten saying he'd read Life of Pi with his daughter and they liked it and so he just thought he'd write to me 
Whoa. That's astonishing. I'm not even American. You know, <laughs> there was no, there was nothing to be gained by that. In fact, I'm sure if the Republicans found that, they'd say, what is he wasting his time writing to this foreign author? <laughs> you know, he, he should be dealing with our troops in Iraq or something. <laughs> so it was completely, a, gr a completely gratuitous act. And you know, this is compared to my own prime minister to whom I've sent a hundred books. <laughs> You know, I sent him. I sent Stephen Harper 100 books with 100 letters, zero replies, <laughs> nothing. And here, President Obama writes to me out of the blue. It was extraordinary. <laughs> Yeah, yes. no, it was, uh, yeah. Wow, I'm sure. Yeah, that's that's an example of great. it. Yeah. So and I get letters from Europeans too, and it, it's, it's, I, I love the letters. I, I, for a while, I was getting letters from Indians too. Yeah. One man who I remember, a very funny letter saying, because <laughs> there's a few deliberate mistakes in life of Pi, and one of them is that there's, um, there's two characters who have the same name. I think, I think I know my book, but I'm starting to forget it. <laughs> but there's that man who has the polio with a big stomach, who's this, this rationalist science teacher, and then there's a baker who's the Muslim character. Oh, they I think both they're called have the Satish, same name. Yeah, That's Satish right. Kumar. Yeah. Kumar, yeah. Yeah, Satish Kumar. And an Indian writer wrote to me, with a very good obvious point mm. that there's no way that a man named Satish Kumar Can would be, be a Muslim. Muslim. Yeah. It'd right. be like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it'd be like Sven McFer, you know, uh, <laughs> some Swedish name being Scottish. When, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> but that was, I wanted the rationalists and the religious to have the same name. Right. So oh. I had this delightful letter from this man saying, yeah, this is not possible. This is a catastrophic <laughs> mistake in your novel. You know, <laughs> you know, this is not possible. And so he complaining about my letter saying that this, you know, and so I wrote back to him explaining that I want him to have the same name to say that rationalism and, and religion could be superimposed, that could be the same, come from the same reality and all that, anyway. So I had the, and uh, another few letters from Minions pointing out what they felt were mistakes in punctuation. So I, <laughs> very, very, and it's interesting the kinds of letters I get, all, you know, from, I also got negative letters, people who hated the book. Really? Especially from, yeah, American evangelicals. <laughs> I got a letter from American evangelicals who um, did not find it, they, they enjoyed the book perhaps, but they did, not, in, they did not find it at all amusing that Pi practiced three religions. To them, Christianity is the only way, and 1.1 million Hindus are, a billion are gonna, you know, end up in hell. And they didn't find it amusing that he was a Muslim and a Hindu. That, mm. And they were lecturing me on, you know, I should abandon such follies and you know, <laughs> just stick to Christianity. So, but I said, even those people who didn't like the book involved themselves in it and yep. created a dialogue. And that, that's mm -hmm. what, uh, yeah, it was an extraordinary experience. How, how did you uh, imagine the mother's character to be? How did I imagine the mother's character? Well, um, what is her core? Um, well, she's stronger than a sense. She's strong. Mm. She's a strong character. Uh, stronger in a sense than the father, who, to mm. my mind, was slightly more bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, the mother, in the second story, of course, turns out to be this incredibly strong character mm. who not only tries to protect her son, mm. but also cling to her humanity. So I was outraged when the cook um, you know, kills the, or lets the Taiwanese sailor die and tries mm. to eat some of his flesh. Mm. Is outraged at that. So she, to me, she was a very strong character. Um, and that's sort of as, as much as I imagined her right. to be. Um, yeah, I, yeah, that's how I, we played it. I and also very loving, because remember in, the, in part one, she, she's the one who reads to him, she's the, she's the one who loves Telling reading and shares stories mm. with him. <clears throat> and you know, when he wants his prayer match, he says, go talk to your father. She, you know, mm. <laughs> stuff mm. that I don't like, go and talk to your father about. Um, so I met her a very strong character. And yes. uh, um, I remember when I wrote the book, one of my fears was that it was too male. I was thinking, Pi's a boy, the tiger's a boy. It had mm. this veneer of an adventure story, therefore kind of masculine. And that mm. worried me, because after all, most mm. readers are women. Mm. You know, it's a generalization <laughs> that's certainly true in Canada. And I think around the world, most readers of fiction tend to be women. And not that I was trying to cover all my audience, but I, was, I didn't want a story that was overly masculine, because that didn't interest me. It wasn't, that mm. wasn't the point of the story. And so I remember the, the character of the mother was very important, because she's one of the few uh, important, was the only important male, female character. And that in was very important yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. um, it was also odd to me how uh, she comes to a terrible end. And in many of the letters, I'd get people saying, I was so horrified when the zebra died. Mm. And they dwell on the suffering of animals. And very few would, and I'd, I'd reply to them saying, you know, it's funny that you should 
dwell on the suffering of the zebra, but you know, in the story, there's a mother who gets, you know, who gets beheaded and eaten by a shark, and no one would notice that for some reason. It's funny how that we're, we're callous with the suffering of human beings, but this, you know, have a dog get run over, and you know, newspapers write about it, whereas if it's an accident of human beings, they don't care as much. It's funny how we, and I, I think that's part of the reason why Life of Pi was so effective, maybe with some people, is animals intrigue people. We're, mm -hmm. we're cynical about our own species. Mm -hmm. We're not so cynical about <coughs> animals. Mm. And so the suffering of animals, we project this innocence onto them. Mm. Mm. And so the suffering of animals you know, affects people. Where sometimes the suffering of human beings doesn't affect us because we sort of blame them for their suffering. Mm. or We found ways to distance ourselves from it. So it's interesting how the character, who the mother who suffers tremendously, um, few readers remarked on that. Whereas the mm. suffering of the animals at the beginning, <clears throat> people were much more, uh, uh, felt that much more keenly. I think it's convenient and more, it's easier to sympathize with something that is weaker than you. Or yeah. Mm. Yeah, that might be it. Yeah. More comfortable doing that. Mm. Or not threatened by them. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. The underdog, literally. <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> the under zebra. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Tabu, I mean, I, we're going to watch the namesake, and I think a lot of people are really looking forward to that. Mm. Um, can you talk about that film? I mean, it hinges so much on you, that film. It mm. really, you know, you, there are a couple of films that I feel that you actually sort of carry off, and, and the namesake certainly one of them. Um, tell us about how, I mean, that's another case in which you've been involved in bringing a novel to the screen, because Jumpa mm. Lahiri's novel was the basis of, of the namesake, and now, we're all eagerly anticipating Life of Pi. Mm. But let's hear about the namesake so that you know, when people watch it, they have a little bit of an insight uh, on so it both from Both my you. films in America are based on mm. really popular books. It's mm. a coincidence. Um, the namesake, yeah, it was, it's an experience which is really, really uh, uh, special to me because it was the first time I was making this big shift uh, geographically to come and shoot for it. And I got a call from Mira at 2 a.m. Mm. one night, and she said, uh, "This this film I'm making, and we are 15 days away from filming, and you have to come to New York and shoot." Oh, that was exactly how it happened. And two weeks was, before the shoot started. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, "We're prepping for two weeks, and you have to come and start shooting." And I've known Mira for many years, so I had that relationship with her, mm. and. Uh, I'd read the book, and when I read the book, it, it's really funny, or maybe because I'm an actor, I can easily uh, picture myself in the characters that I'm reading in mm. books, if I like them. Mm. So some part of me wants to play them, mm. if ever it's made into a movie. So I always connected to Ashima's character, mm. and uh, it was so me, and so like parts of her were uh, so much like who I am. And I always thought that, oh, Ever if it's made into a movie yet, you know, I should play. Oh, you already action. had that in mind. So, I mean, I yeah. was maybe I was just, you know, part of my yeah. imagination. Right. Because whenever you read a book, you yeah. go into an imagination and yeah. you create these characters for yourself. Right. So it was really uncanny that, you know, Mira called and uh, that whole experience was, uh, uh, it really uh, altered a lot for me mm. in terms of work and in terms of, experiences with people. Mm. I got exposed to this whole uh, new bunch of interesting people that I mm. worked with. And uh, this whole way of working in the West. Not that, I mean, it's very different or anything. But uh, it, it, was, it was really nice. Uh, I found like a, a second home sort of a thing in the United States mm. since, since then. I made some great friends. Yeah. And I made some great friends off, uh, off the set also in the apartment where I was living in New York. Mm. And uh, it, it was a nice experience. It was, uh, for me as an actor, because I was acting, I was emoting in English, that mm. was uh, another dimension mm. that I explored. It was, uh, it was funny because I would come back to my apartment and feel a little different about having shot and acted, mm. and I was wondering what it, what it was. And then I, later I realized it was the language I was mm. expressing in, you know. And I understood the relationship between uh, self-expression and language mm. and emotion and human relationships mm. after I did that film. You know, uh, when you're 
expressing in a language that you're not used to expressing yeah. yourself in there's one part of you which remains detached from that emotion mm. you know it's almost like you can watch yourself mm. experiencing that emotion but you're not you've not become that emotion because you're not thinking in that language right you know? so it was really interesting to experience that as yeah. an actor yeah. in my craft so yeah it was great and whatever followed and and the film was received so beautifully yeah. it was it was, was that your first movie in english uh yeah i've done an, a a french film but we shot it in english but many many years back french film shot in english yeah it must be canadian <laughs> <laughs> what, what film was that uh it was called hanuman it was made by this uh, collaboration between the uk and france okay but it was shot in but it was in english yeah okay. it was really uh, i don't even remember anything because it was really really <coughs> long back 15 years back okay. that time i was not thinking so much about all these things okay but the name say i really thought and and really it was a really strong character also yeah. it was i was happy to be playing a an important character in an important film you know yeah. it's not just an american film yeah. that you come and do and yeah. cross over and hmm. all that yeah. i really uh, and it became as we shot and as the movie progressed it really became something else um on the script level it was not it was not meant to be so much ashima's film you know right but really uh, it was just amazing how this character unfolded and the relationship between me and irfan right it was uh, fantastic that whole yeah. experience well for those of you who don't know i mean the namesake follows the the journey of a of a young couple who who moves immigrant, from, immigrant yeah, couple. couple so in a sense there are a lot of resonances i'm sure with people here yeah and yeah and that's why it uh, reached out to such a large audience yeah. overseas and yeah. people connected to it it was it was like we were telling their stories i remember after so many screenings people would walk up to me and mm. you know they and they was they would be overwhelmed you know after <clears> watching it because this was exactly what they'd gone through when they came here in the 70s mm. and i and i know that journey because i mean i have family in the united states i've been okay. visiting them since i don't know 20 years and i've seen that you know i've seen that mm. uh, that winter and i've seen <laughs> my cousins going through their yeah. uh pregnancies and everything in that driving their own cars and doing everything on their own missing yeah. home and mm. all of that mm. so it, it, it touched a core in a lot of people it's i think yeah so yeah well obviously that and this sense of language you were talking about sama must have clicked because certainly ashima's character contains that nervousness that little veil that she has between this new world and what mm. she's she's come to and and that it comes out so beautifully in the film